Welcome to another episode of Stand. This is your weekly workout regimen to become a thought warrior. Here in this show, we're going to get to learn from courageous and compassionate Americans who are change agents in their communities, their neighborhoods, and their cities. I'm Kelly Chewbacca, and I'm joined by my wonderful husband and co-host, Nikki Chewbacca. He always has my back. Thank you, hun. We're so glad to have you today. Join our community of standouts. Subscribe to our show at The Stand Show on YouTube. You can also find us on social media under Kelly for Alaska and always online on our website, standshow.org. If you leave a review for the show this week, you'll be entered to win a free sticker from our show, Stand. So make sure to leave a review and remember to invite a friend to join our community of standouts where we stand firm and stand strong together. Today we're going to have a really interesting discussion with our guest, Seneca Scott. Seneca is a graduate of Cornell University and besides having an incredibly cool name, he is also a cousin of the late Coretta Scott King, the wife of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. In keeping with his family's incredible legacy of service, Seneca is a successful community organizer, a former candidate for the mayor of Oakland, California, and a founder of a nonprofit group called Neighbors Together Oakland. Seneca does this really cool thing. He describes himself as a post-partisan solutionary. I hope you're as intrigued about that as I am. He's been interviewed by various local and national media personalities, including Megan Kelly and Tucker Carlson. And it's such a privilege to have you on the show today, Seneca. Thank you for being here and welcome to Stand. Thank you. It's uh, very excited to be here and I can't wait to uh, chat with you both today. Yes, Seneca, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. We've got a lot of ground we want to cover today, but before we go any further, we can't miss the opportunity to talk about your unique family background. As a cousin of the late Coretta Scott King, the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you're a member of one of our nation's most distinguished families. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that legacy has shaped and impacted your life and work? And do you have any fun stories about uh, the Coretta Scott side of the family would love to hear those too. Yeah. Uh, it has impacted my life tremendously. Um, but ironically, it's not something that I came public with until very recently. It was the statue that was erected of Martin and Coretta in Boston uh, by the Embrace Boston Foundation that uh, led me to write an op-ed about the statue. And then that's how everyone in Oakland found out that I was related to uh, Coretta because I never mentioned it during uh, my run for city council or mayor. I never mentioned it when I was a labor union leader 10 years ago in the city. Um, mostly just because it wasn't my own legacy and as proud as I was of it, I wanted to go out and, and do my own work and not, and not uh, get any favoritism or perceived favoritism because of my family status. So it's not something that I was public with, but it has inspired me from a very young age to be of service to my community. I went to college, uh, School of Industrial Labor Relations at Cornell University, became a union organizer right out of college, did that for a while, and then went right from there to being a, a community organizer because I saw that that was something that was more urgently needed as our families and communities I've been disintegrating uh, the, the uh, bookend of our society, being the elders and our children have fallen and uh, we're, we're collapsing along with it. So I saw more urgent work to build multiracial, multi-class coalition, which ironically ends up being right where Martin was some 60 years ago. Hmm. Uh, I have one fun story for you if you want me to tell you. It'll be about two minutes. Please. So my father tells me a great story about when him and Coretta, he calls it, a, became adults together. Now, obviously, Coretta was an adult. My father was 30 years old. Um, that means that all of us have been born. I have three siblings, two brothers and a sister. So he had four children. He was a young man himself. Now, Coretta's family, um, Coretta is my grandfather's niece. Her father, Obadiah Scott, is my grandfather's older brother. They were very close. 
And many people don't know this, but Martin married up. Coretta's, uh, our family was affluent landowning family, and we had a lot of uh, property and, and, and wealth. And so we would travel to each other's estates when, when Coretta and the family would come to uh, Ohio, to Cleveland, they would stay at my grandfather's uh, property. And when we would travel to Georgia and Atlanta, they would stay at the King's property. So my father was in Atlanta. He had one of them old Super 8 recorders. People used to record with, like in, in uh, Wonder Years era <laughs> type thing. And my father is a photographer by trade. So he's running around and recording everyone. And Coretta and all the, all the uh, elders, and I say elders, I mean, you're talking about women in their 50s, right? Black women, ranging from, you know, 40s to 60s, or maybe older. And there's a kitchen full of women. And he's running through with the camera. And Dexter follows him. And he says to Coretta, Mom, Bobby's got a camera like I want. I want that camera that Bobby has. And Coretta turned to the woman who said, this is our problem. My grown son is asking his mother for a camera. <laughs> <laughs> We're not raising our young men right these days. Hmm. Now, for some perspective, Coretta was a single mother for the most of her children's life. Hmm. As iconic as she was, she was a single mother. She never remarried. There was no male figure in their house who could fill a gap left by the great Dr. King. So there were obviously male figures around, but not directly in the household. And like many single parent households, they had similar struggles in terms of um, leadership with, with her son. So my father stayed in the kitchen with his camera, like a fly on a wall, because he knew the rule, if he said anything, he was going to kick him out. So he stayed there, and they allowed him to stay. And he witnessed their conversation. And he stayed there for about 45 minutes. After he left, Coretta stopped him in the hallway and says, Bobby, you've got children, right? He says, y'all have four children. And they sat and they talked about their children for 30, 40 minutes in that hallway. And our children, he had been a child to her. He barely, so many kids in my family. Right, uh, my father's one of seven or six. You lose count. I mean, we just got cousins everywhere. So you know, you kind of remember people, which you don't really like, see them as equals as adults. And after that conversation, where they talked about uh, faith and and raising a family, and asking about my mother and challenges as a as a as a father and raising three sons, um, asking him for advice on his own peers. A beautiful moment that he shared with me. I never heard that story until six months ago. But um, to me, that's the coolest story I've ever heard about hmm. my family and Coretta because it shows, it, it, it humanizes her and shows the, uh, the tremendous struggle she went through to raise her family. Yeah, she was a tremendously strong woman. We can't forget that uh, everything Dr. King accomplished, he couldn't have accomplished without her. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's amazing just to hear of that 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 family connection and to see that the legacy of love and service lives on and continues um, through the generations, and that's that's just amazing. You know, you you've described yourself as neither conservative nor progressive anymore. You don't believe that the left or the right have all of the solutions to the you know, the many issues that are uh, plaguing our communities, uh, but that we can work together to find them. Uh, to that, uh, on that vein, you have described yourself as a post-partisan solutionary. Ke Kelly re referred to that in the introduction, a post-partisan solutionary. I love the sound of that. But what exactly does it mean? What is a post-partisan solutionary, Seneca? Oh, I'm glad you asked me. Uh, post-partisan solutionary means that I don't go left or right. I go up, down, either you have integrity or you don't. Hmm. When you look at our two parties, they are coalescing into a, a very dangerous uniparty of sort, where they're completely aligned when it comes to any interest of the elite, and they're, and they're leaving behind uh, the masses of Americans who are not identifying with either party. But as a matter of fact, if you check the numbers, more people identify as an independent than either party. I think it's almost two to one, like people who identify with a, a particular political party. And so, uh, that's been what I mean by that. And solutionaries means that we're here to have solution. Leadership is action, not position. We need solution to our current issues. 
Uh, some of these issues we're facing are born of an age of consequences from our own sins. Some of them are just nature. There is no security in nature. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Helen Keller. I used to remember that. But, uh, security, there you go, security is largely a superstition. It does not exist in nature. Life is either a grand adventure or nothing. Mm. And so I want people to get out of that binary way of thinking because they're using it to distract us. And if you look at where did this paradigm start, most people can't even tell you where the left-right paradigm started. So I'll ask you, do you know where the left-right paradigm started at? I can't think of a specific date. No. It was the French Revolution. Hmm. Interesting. Now, we don't have time in this segment to go through, but until the French Revolution, there was no left or right. That was a political spectrum born of that movement, and we've followed it since. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's problematic. It's been used to control us, and I think it's time we jettison those those titles and be team human and do things at our best um, for our families and our communities and our neighborhoods. That's right. Okay, it's time to take a break there. We'll be back after our break with Seneca Scott, former candidate for mayor of Oakland, California, to hear more about being a post-partisan solutionary. Remember to follow us on YouTube at The Stand Show. Leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, and you'll be entered to win a sticker from Stand this week. We'll be back after this. Make sure to stand by. Market Tactical specializes in combat effective weapon systems and prides themselves on the best prices in the state of Alaska. Weka Tactical sells firearms, ammunition, gear, body armor, night vision, and much more. They offer a price match guarantee as well as a 15% discount to all first responders. Visit Weka Tactical at 5630 B Street in Anchorage. Weka Tactical, Alaska's premier store for combat effective weapon systems. Welcome back to Stand. We're here with Seneca Scott, former candidate for mayor of Oakland, California, and a strong community leader. Seneca, we're so glad you're here. Nikki and I are all about bringing about effective solutions to the many challenges that we face in our communities, our city, and our nation. You've got a lot of experience doing this. Um, we believe, like you, we need to move past partisanship and into partnership. We need to get back mm. to listening to each other and learning from each other, getting to dialogue to find actual solutions, getting past demonization into things that actually help the community. So we would like to learn from you on this as a post-partisan solutionary. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we can begin to shift focus away from standing apart and towards standing together, the path that leads from partisanship to partnership and solving community problems? How do we actually do that? Well, there's a couple different approaches. First is the actual organizing approach. When it comes to organizing people, there's a methodology, there's a flow. First is educate, then you educate, then you organize. People who skip to education without education are seeking to create zealots and, and cult followers. That's what you saw with the Black Lives Matter and Antifa uprisings in 2020. There was very little education about any systemic issues, but instead a, a direct move to emotion. So we need to educate people around local politics how local policies and these lowest level elected offices affect their uh, daily life more than anything, and the fact that every single election is indeed local with the one exception of the United States president, because even your senators and Congress people are elected from neighborhoods. So we need to go out and, and talk to our neighbors um, to get to know each other better. But the second part, and this is the part that I want to talk about the most, we must bring back debate real debate in local politics. Mm. I've run for two offices in Oakland. I have not had a single debate, wow. not one. <laughs> what they do is they do these things called forums. So liberal cities like forums, because they like low information voters. They don't like their track records challenge. So here's the difference between a forum and a debate. Mm -hmm. When I ask them, hey, is there a rebuttal? Is it debate? It's like, no, we do forums because debates are arguments and that's not productive. People just need the information to make the best decision. Now, that sounds good to some people, 
But I call BS. I'm going to read you a passage from what I call my Bible, my second Bible, not the real Bible, <laughs> but my organizing Bible. It's Revolt of the Elise by Christopher Lash. If you've never read this book, I suggest you pick it up. Uh, it is a, every sentence is going to have to be writing it down. But there's a chapter called The Lost Art of Argument. And I'm going to read this. What democracy requires is vigorous public debate, not information. Very first sentence. Hmm. Of course, it needs information too, but the kind of information it needs can only be generated by debate. We do not know what we need to know until we ask the right question, and we can identify the right questions only by subjecting our own ideas about the world to the test of public controversy. Information, usually seen as a precondition of debate, is better understood as its byproduct. When we get into arguments that fully focus and engage our attention, we become avid seekers of relevant information. Otherwise, we take in information passively if we take it in at all. Hmm. They know this. They know this. And this is why they don't want debates, because they don't want to be challenged with people who have common sense. They can't hold up their argument to the test of public controversy. So they demonize, they slander, they go for reputation destruction. They do any anti-intellectual, and I say they, I mean both parties. But right now, we're talking more about the black who is completely guilty of that. Um, there is no room for discourse in the middle ground. You would be follow locked up and key with the far left progressive or whatever, regressive policies, or you're ostracized and demonized and called all types of names. People are over it. So first thing we need to do is bring back intelligent debate, intellectual, no more anti, anti-intellectualism amongst our elite who are doing this on purpose. We need to educate people so they can actually understand what's going on in these debates at the baseline. Uh, these will restore a healthier democracy, but none of that will matter if your elections are free and fair. I'm going to do this really quick because if we don't have time today to talk about this. You want to bring me back on, we can. Our open election for mayor last year was decided by less than 700 votes. We have rigged choice voting, just like you guys have in Alaska. Right. Rigged cho- choice voting, I call it. An election decided by less than 700 votes, 3,000 plus votes were disqualified in, in black and brown communities at that. We don't know why they were disqualified. We can't get a manual recount. That means the registrar who disqualified the votes chose the winner, not the people of Oakland. Not to mention that that election took a week to count. It had so many inconsistencies and violations of our city charter. It was blatantly a fraudulent election. It's been zero justice. No one's talking about it. And we're entering another election cycle without showing up any of those mistakes. So, frankly, until we restore actual free and integrity in our election, we're going to have some serious problems in the days ahead in America. That's a really interesting perspective, and yeah, I would love to have that discussion at uh, some other some <laughs> other point. We could, do, we could do a whole segment on RCV. Yeah, well, it's really interesting we that you, could. yeah that you talk about uh, the debate versus forum thing. I had the same experience running for U.S. Senate. We kept doing all these forums, and there's no opportunity to actually go back and forth on real issues that matter because if we did. Um, there's so many holes in the incumbent's record. It's since they're like Swiss cheese, but you're not allowed to ever actually point it out. Um, and, and so she would just sit there and flat out lie. And it's like, if it fits your voting uh, record. Well, here's how you fix that. Here's how you beat that. You force the debate in public opinion like we're doing now. Yeah. You yeah. force the debate. You skip their debates and you take it to the people and you demand and you just got to be better at communicating. We, we tried that. Yeah. yeah. And also uh, yeah. so many points that you correctly well, make about go? ranked choice. What's I, that? How did it go? You said you tried that. I mean, well, I, I it would, like the, uh, she just never agreed to do a debate. So we did the same thing. She won't agree to do a debate. And then she and the, with the help of the media that uh, supports the policies that she votes for. Um, well, we're doing these debates. Would we'll just reframe the forums as debates. And to your yeah, point, the yeah. the low information voter. I don't know when we last saw an actual debate. Even the presidential debates are technically forums. 
Um, you still have a moderator and a fact checker there. A debate has a moderator, a fact checker, and you're not allowed to do any anti-intellectual argument. You have to point out errors or omissions in your opponent's fact or logic. That's it. Right. Like, That's let's go back to University Debate Club. Yeah, we don't do that on purpose. Right. Go figure. Well, so going back and forth on issues, one thing I think is uh, really beneficial that you actually took up in your campaign is the issue about law enforcement and public safety. And interestingly, to your point, and you mentioned this about your, uh, this in your last question, it's kind of the, the people of Oakland against the establishment that intends to maintain control. There's kind of a rallying of maybe people who aren't normally on the same side of an issue all coming together around public safety. So we have the NAACP and the senior pastor of Acts Full Gospel Church recently writing a letter to Oakland's elected leaders making national headlines where they're saying that failed leadership and the defund the police movement and the district attorney's unwillingness to charge and prosecute people who murder and commit life-threatening serious crimes and then this proliferation of anti-police rhetoric have, quote, created a heyday for Oakland criminals. So we wanted to ask you, what are all of your thoughts about the defund the police movement and anti-police rhetoric and how it's affected Oakland and its skyrocketing crime rate? What's your take on all this? That's a big question. Uh, We've got about it's a two big minutes. One. <laughs> uh, uh, we, could, we could go on the next. I will say that I am an officer and a member of the Oakland chapter of the NAACP. I was a part of that effort. I'm also a national sergeant at arms for the state of California and Hawaii for the NAACP and was at the last national convention. Here's the issue with defund. You can't have a monolithic approach to police reform. Every single police municipality and department had to be treated as standalone. I'll give you a ready example. Take the city of Oakland, the city of Boston. Oakland has 450,000 people. We have about 700 officers. We're supposed to have 1,200 by FBI formula on 911 doesn't even work. Uh, we're, we're, 911 mm-hmm. doesn't work. We don't have a functional 911. So take that and, and also only 10% of Oakland's police officers live in the city of Oakland. Compare that to huh. Boston. Boston has a first generation Asian American mayor, progressive led city council, and active defund the police movement. Here's the difference. Boston police had to had to live for 10 years in Boston. If you want to be a police officer, you've got to be local for the first 10 years. Boston had over uh, 2,200 officers for a city of 600,000 people. So nearly two to one numbers of officers of Oakland, period. And then you talk about a host of other laws and, that I'm not gonna get into, but just when you talk about public safety, if, you're, if I'm in Boston and we have a safe, livable city and we're identifying we could use more money and, 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 and nonviolent intervention or different things that are holistic, that could be, I'm willing to experiment with those things because we do need law enforcement reform. What we're seeing here isn't the best way to do things. We should always be looking to make our services more efficient and improve them. Mm-hmm. However, defunding the police in Oakland, when you have no rule of law, 911 doesn't work, and right. you don't even have enough cops to drive the street, it's absolutely idiotic. People don't seem to see that because it's performative altruism. It's all about performance. It's a, it's a play for them. They're, it's the luxury politics of the elite that they vote for that until recently mm-hmm. in Oakland have not affected the, uh, the, the people in the rich neighborhood. Only recently, now that the home invasions and the shootings and the violence have gone to the hill and no one in our entire city is safe now, we have an opportunity. Instead of pointing the finger and saying, see, you deserve this, that's what people want to do. Who cares? We need peace, reconciliation. We have a rally for solidarity and solution to Saturday. That's what we need. Yeah. We need solidarity with the elite who have the money, who have been voting the wrong way. Bring them down to the neighborhoods. Let them see where their votes have been. And then they can pay. They can have their own personal restorative justice by just voting better and, and working with people across the city so we can create an open where there are no more good and bad neighborhoods, but a thriving, beautiful city throughout. And we're doing just that. So that's the, the good news is that the silver lining and the progressive um, dangerous policies across the country, the divestment from public safety and law enforcement, which I'll add is deliberate. If you look up the largest contributor to the defund the police movement, it's the eBay founder, who is also mm-hmm. one of the largest contributors in Robocop, basically, AI right. police. Oh, so why someone, I mean, come on now, this stuff is basic. 
Not even that. They're not even hiding it anymore. They're mocking us. Let's pick up and just on the other side of the break with Seneca and pick up on this fascinating conversation. Be right back. Africa New Day with mission is actually to create leaders, to change a culture, and transform a nation. We believe that this is an area where God wants us to make a difference. You know, He has called us the light of the world. Well, where does the light shine? Where there is darkness. As you pray with us, as you contribute to our efforts, we believe that together we can make a difference. We're back with Seneca Scott on stand. I'm getting great thoughts from him on how to be a postpartisan solutionary and actually find solutions to problems. Let's pick up with where we left off. So Seneca, you were talking about um, the the movement to defund the police and how it was f largely funded by uh, the founder of eBay. Sadly, what we're ex what you're experiencing in Oakland seems to be happening all over the country when progressive policies are being used to address crime. And I think that's part of what makes Oakland's story so important for everyone to understand because it's it's a microcosm of what's happening on a broader basis across the country uh, in urban areas. Uh, when you were running for mayor of Oakland in 2022, you did an interview with City Journal, a periodical out there, and you talked about how Oakland has experienced a 24% increase in homelessness in recent years. That's a huge increase. And we've, we've seen similar, uh, a similar dynamic here in Anchorage, just this skyrocketing homelessness. And we're all concerned about it because we care about uh, you know, our fellow man. As a solutionary, what would you recommend to address the issue of homelessness? Granted, every city is a little different, but what are your thoughts on how we can get a handle on this? That is a longer than 12 minute answer. I'll give you some bullet points. Okay. You got to divide it into two different issues. Affordability and cost of living issues, rising rent is separate from drug tourism. So in Oakland, we have a drug tourism problem that's the responsible for the majority of our unhoused population. If you look at the numbers, that is increased, it's easily quantifiable and provable. I'll give you the smoking gun. Oakland had the longest standing eviction moratorium in the United States of America due to COVID. It just ended in July of this year. Three year eviction moratorium, three years plus. People didn't have to pay rent. Many people abused it. This government enabled theft. We have over $100 million owed to small property owners in the city of Oakland alone wow. and lost rent. So if you didn't have to pay rent and no one could be evicted, how does your homeless population skyrocket by 28%, 30%? That's a good question. People are coming here for the promised land of milk and fentanyl. And not do anything you want. You can sell drugs, you can prostitute. You are a protected class citizen if you're homeless and you're not contributing. However, if you're a taxpayer just trying to make it, you're a second class citizen forced to allow mm. people to steal your steal your home, steal food from your restaurant, steal stuff from your store, as long as it's not more than $900, and you have a new repercussion. That's why businesses are closing every single day in the city of Oakland. So part of that is the drugs. In order to deal with the drugs, first you have to stop the fentanyl epidemic. We have open borders. There's no more opiate epidemic. In Africa, it's out. We don't do opium anymore. It's all synthetic fentanyl coming from India and China through South America and up through our border. We all know it. What the heck is going on? We had 18 deaths eight days ago in San Francisco in one day. Wow. 18 overdoses. So that's one issue with the fentanyl war. Let's leave that where it is. How do you fix that? Wrap around, stop the drugs from coming in give people the services they need, require people to participate in their own healing. Hmm. Where if you don't do that, you're not able to continue to take from people who are working hard to pay taxes and make it. 
Everyone has a responsibility not to take from others. You can do whatever you want if you're not hurting other people. You want to go out in the middle of nowhere and, and do whatever and camp out. If you're not, if you're cleaning up and you're not burning down the forest, no one's ever cared about that. We call them curiosity kids or hippies or whatever. When it comes to what we're seeing now, this is a managed decline of our city. None of this is because of lack of ideas. This is coming directly funded the same pattern. A nonprofit wow. industrial a nonprofit industrial complex, uh progressive city council stock puppets who never who are all the same caricatures of each other, city to city, same rhetoric. Who are they funded by? Zuckerberg, Soros, Todd Steyer. You can go through the list of mega billionaires who are funding these, and all of them have interests directly related to fix the problems that they create. Why has no one put this together yet? And why is no one holding the billionaire class accountable for the destruction of the American working class? So that's another real issue. I know it's, uh, it's, it's asymmetrically seeming related to homeless, but these, in the, in the, these nonprofits that are pushing this stuff are all funded by these mega billionaires. Mm -hmm. So they want this to happen. They want things to happen like there's no single family home ownership. Anything they can do to stop working Americans from owning property, they would do it. And I remind you, just back in 2012, Bernie Sanders had a whole platform on getting more Americans to own single family homes and investment property. What's happened there? What's happened there? Right? It's almost like this just completely reversed to no one deserves to own anything unless you're part of the elite and you do everything we say. Hmm. So the homeless population is, is a byproduct of our managed decline of our American cities being ushered in by a billionaire class who seeks to take over every facet of control over our lives. It is not a conspiracy. I do not have a tinfoil hat on. This is happening in America. and People will be wise to wake up and start organizing against it right now before it's too late. Yes, Seneca, it's a really interesting observation that you, that you made here. The nonprofit industrial complex with an intentional management of the decline of our cities. And I remember RFK Jr. saying something like this too. Why are these, you know, multi-billion dollar companies coming in and buying up all of the single family homes? So you, we're moving towards a state where we're not going to be able to, as you say, have any private property ownership. It's all intentional, which um, leads us back to a question that we wanted to ask you about uh, you've talked about this before, the root causes of sort of a victimhood mentality. And there's something that you wrote, or, or someone asked you a question about this, and you said, you don't like root causes. What is a root cause? The root cause is us. It's people. We would like you to just share this a little bit more about v victimhood mentality and your thoughts on that, why you think it's so damaging. Um, just share with us a little bit more about your thinking on that. It's damaging because it does, it's defeatist. And it's not how, how black people lifted ourselves up out of our uh, oppression. Um, I'm going to read a poem for you because I think this poem does it the best. And But it's intentional. If you look at our, our first wave, the 60s, when people were literally fighting to restore the right to educate themselves, own property, not be lynched in the streets by racist police, and not be demonized for the color of our skin. We were fighting against a very real oppression 60 years ago. And it's not the same anymore. They're cosplaying. If you look at the language of people who are actually directly affected and in danger by the most intense period of racism and vitriol in our history, they never were victims. Hmm. They went and built Black Wall Street. So we talk about Black Wall Street being destroyed, but no one ever talked about what went into building it. Hmm. Why is that? Why do we have things like self-determination, which is Kukukakalia and Kwanzaa? Look at all these principles of Kwanzaa. Not one of them says I'm a victim. So I'm going to read this poem from the Pledge, from um, Abiyo Doom from The Last Poets. And they are credited with being the founders of hip hop. I know Abiyo Doom, the author of this personally. He is the uncle of the late friend of mine, Rashawn Hilson, who died of a heart attack um, a few years back. I'm sorry. So he's a professor at Columbia University, very famous guy, a beautiful man. He made this pledge, and I start my, my rallies like this. This is his pledge because he didn't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, then again, I can agree with people from all types of political spectrums. He felt that that pledge wasn't for him. He wanted to do something else. 
I say that because of this. Think about how militant, black radical, and all of that. It checks all the boxes that the woke to the progressive state that they're in. But then I want you to listen to what he says. I want to be what I can be, to be proud, healthy, and free. I want to share what I know to help my brothers and sisters grow. I want to feel good about me and blame no one for my misery because I'll be strong and turn it around. I want to go up, I'm not going down. I want to do what I can do to make all my dreams come true. Remember my past, the good and bad, how I made it up even when I was sad. I want to share whatever my gift, and when you're low, I'll give you a lift. I want mm. to live without fear and know that I'm blessed to be in here. I want to live without fear <clears throat> to know that we're blessed for being here. I want to live without fear. That's I want to live without fear. I talk about that word. Victims are scared. Scared people are easy to control. Mm. And therein you have why we do that. That's powerful. You know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about how, yeah, we're, we're the people who produce Benjamin Banneker and <laughs> Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington and, and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Shaka Zulu. And I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. We, we can go on and on. George and, Washington uh, Carver. George man, Washington Carver. I mean, yes. Come on. We are, we are a powerful, gifted, talented people who helped build this nation. We are not victims. How do we get people? I know we've only got about one minute left in this I segment. I think we should wait. That's okay. a big question, and I want to hear the full answer. Okay. Well, the question we're going to ask on the other side of the break, Sitika, is how do we break people out of this victimhood mentality? And I say that as somebody whose father was an impoverished uh, a child in the rural Democratic Republic of the Congo who made it to the U.S. and built a life for himself. It can be done. We will be back after this short break with Seneca Scott. Don't go anywhere. We're on YouTube at The Stan Show. Leave a review and get a free sticker. Our website is stanshow.org. Stand by. Welcome back to Stand. It's your weekly dose of courage. We're here with Seneca Scott, former candidate for mayor in Oakland, California, with a ton of solutions and practical application for how you can make a difference in your community. Seneca, thank you for modeling the way. We had a fantastic question lined up by my amazing co-host, Nikki Chewbacca, right before the break. Nikki, can you paraphrase it for us and kick us off? <laughs> Seneca, you were talking about how we need to break out of the victimhood mentality, that it's defeatist and destructive. How do we do that? How do we bring people, and I'm not just talking about African Americans, I mean, the people in our local communities too, who are feeling like there's nothing that they can do, they're victims of circumstance, how do we bring to them a mindset of empowerment that can help them to break through and change their lives? Great question. So uh, I dealt with this a lot as a union organizer, and we used to call it battered worker syndrome or battered nurses, battered wife, battered, same profile, battered neighbor syndrome. You're beat up, you're apathetic, you're checked out. So emotion helps. What? So um, the best thing to do is you got to move people from apathy. Personally, mm -hmm. it, you, it only takes one courageous person. So there's a YouTube video I share as part of my training for organizers, but let me back up. Simply put, to start, what you have to do is start knocking on your neighbor's doors. You're less afraid the more you know that all people, people are gonna help you. Mm. What gets rid of your fear and anxiety is knowing that your neighbors have your back and you can communicate with them and you're working together, making your actions match your ambition to create better communities. So. Uh, we call it building parallel systems involving creating agriculture spaces, et cetera. But you have to talk to people. And we've lost our third space. There's no third space. We don't go to church. 
I mean, well, a bar, a bars and coffee shops are fine. They're not bad, those places, but they're so expensive now. The average person can't access them with any regularity. So where do we go now to communicate with each other as equals? D -d Despite your financial status, we don't have them. So the easiest thing to create are local community garden, which everyone has the space to do to create those spaces that also provide nutrition. But I want to get into how do you get past where you start at? You gotta have to be a little daring and crazy. So there's a video. If you go to YouTube and you write "boy dancing on a hill leadership," hmm. a video will come up, and it'll show this kid on a college party. It's a big college party and a big slope, and everyone's sitting down and drinking and chilling. It's not a razor. It's like people hanging out on the grass or they're sitting down in their blankets. No one's dancing. This one guy stands up, runs to the top of the hill. When he starts doing this little weird dance, he cannot <laughs> dance. He looks like Elaine on Seinfeld. Sounds like one okay? of kids. <laughs> he looks ridiculous. About 30 seconds in, another guy comes and he starts dancing with him. That's your first follower. That's an underrated form of leadership. But you don't have a movement yet. If your first follower that's good enough, a third person will come. Now you have a movement. In one minute in this video, you see one guy from start to finish. I think it's maybe three minutes top, not one minute. I'm sorry. You see one guy go from people laughing at him mm -hmm. to a higher hill dancing like maniac, and you don't see him anymore. You never. And if you just got to that party, you would have never knew that was started by one person who they were laughing at. Gandhi said it. First they laugh, first they know you. Then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Hmm. Now that's not a, a you know, exact, uh, you know, to that analogy to that boy on there. There was no fight in that party, but you get what I'm saying. They ignored him, then they laughed at him, and then someone joined him, and then another person joined him. And the Bible says where two or more are gathered, and that's cool, but I like three. Mm -hmm. I'm big on three. Three is a group, two is a pair, three is a group. You've got to work until you get a group. And once you've got that group of even three people, you can change your city. What we're doing in Oakland is we're trying to organize just 2% of our elected by, by New Year. Like 5,000 people, about 250,000 elected voters mm -hmm. to make sure that we're all in unison and we're all communicating. Not as robots, but we're communicating what we want to see from our city and what the qualifications of leadership we want to elect and that we will not elect anyone else who our neighbors do not consent to. If people felt that there was a movement that they could be a part of, and we started with just simple lawn signs. I believe in the power of neighbors to create a safe and livable city. Nothing about government accountability, nothing about taxpayer money. It was a, just like JFK's act, not what your country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? It's the same message. It's a winning message. You've got to fight like hell to get that message to your neighbors and you can't give up on them. And if you're one of those people who are on the hill dancing and you're one of those brave souls who want to sacrifice some embarrassment or temporary embarrassment for the movement, <laughs> um, just know that it's worth it. Right. And, and that it's, it's, it's the, 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 uh, the uncomfortability will pass. It will pass <laughs> before you know it. Then they can't cancel the truth. And they can't cancel a child of God. Just do, be an honest person, move with integrity, and you will be fine. Don't worry about the naysayers. Talk to your neighbors. The vast majority of us want the same thing. Safe, livable cities where our families can be raised and we can afford our rent right. and have a fun life. That's really or wise, our, our Seneca. Stuff, you know? Yeah. I try and normalize awkward, especially for the children that we're raising. And I've just explained to them exactly what you just said. Um, life is just a series of awkward moments separated by snacks. And the sooner you can just get comfortable with, there's just going to be a whole lot of awkward around here. Uh, the sooner this whole thing gets better, but also to your point, the sooner you become a leader because leadership is just really awkward, but you can get a whole lot of people dancing if you just embrace the awkward. And also you don't feel so awkward anymore because you just get really comfortable with awkward. Um, 
I'd love to talk to you about your neighborhood initiative, Neighbors Together Oakland. You founded it. You describe it as a postpartisan organization of solutionaries who are active in being the change we want to see in our world. You do that through your four pillars. I want you to tell us about that. How is that working in the local community and local government? Um, can you tell us how you use the term accessible housing rather than affordable housing, which is what we hear a lot from community leaders. Um, just tell us a little bit more about that. This is the last question we have time for, but I want to make sure that we hear what, about what you're doing, what's close to your heart. Yeah, we got about four sure. minutes. Yeah, well, we've been knocking on doors and organizing, um, making sure that we're building, identifying leaders, getting people educated on our government, how it works, our city charter, how decisions are made, and their ability to influence these decisions. Most people have been apathetic and low information voters for so long that now that they're engaged, uh, literally out of self-defense, they're a lot more, um, they're paying attention a lot closer. When it comes to working with our government, unfortunately, the vast majority of our government uh, are progressive zealots. The few bright lights that are there um, have bravely and courageously stood with us. And for that, they were going to be uh, immensely rewarded. Our rally this Saturday has taken a life of its own. Our city council and mayor have actually tried to stifle our First Amendment rights by illegally calling organizers and supporters of the rally, threatening them if they would attend, and trying wow. to call me every vile name in the book because of my religious beliefs. It's absolutely beyond the pale. The good news is that it didn't work. Yeah. It backfired. Thanks for taking so, a stand. It abs if people are tired of it. People are over it right now. They don't want to hear anything else from people in positions of power except solution. Mm -hmm. And so being hyper-focused on solutions and bringing people together, um, has really worked. So our four pillars, first, they're not, it's, our four pillars are based on a high, a Malthusian's hierarchy of needs. Oh. You have to be safe. You yep. need air. We didn't talk about air and water because it gets too esoteric. But if you look, if you think about it, every one of our hierarchy of needs is compromised right now, especially for working people. Mm -hmm. Our air qualities in neighborhoods are poor. Our water quality is, is, is depending on what city, if you're in Michigan, Flint, or Mississippi, or wherever, we've got lead in our water at a local high school over here still in 2023. Wow. Uh, our air quality is affected by either pollution or the, the fires that are being set deliberately, I believe, uh, all of these things that are happening, we're, we're affected. And our food is being controlled. Food is power. If you look at anything, food always becomes political in, in, in societies. We want to get ahead of that. And so that's why we made um, local food system uh, our second pillar, because it's very important to make sure that people are, are, are having healthy, nutritious food. Also, when you talk about our child soldiers that are on the streets of Oakland, none of them were fed healthy food, because none of them are alive. How can you show someone you love them if you're not feeding them? Right, mm -hmm. so that's a big, a big gap. Then we take accessible housing because our, our unhoused population, a lot of them are on drugs and have mental illness problems. Mm -hmm. If you're like, if you have high levels of mental acuity and mental illness and you're on drugs, you can't afford anything anytime soon. You need to access shelter or housing right now where you can have the services to get better. Yeah, that makes and sense. And then we also, and we also need elders on fixed incomes who can't afford things to be able to access housing. So also affordability is weaponized. No one can tell me what affordable housing is. It ends up being a nonprofit group where people are competing for the right to build housing where they can make money. And then last, we use our, our thriving local businesses because commerce is what separates us from being a developed society and, and being sort of um, nomadic. You have to have commerce. And so that is what modern society demands and cities have always been a place where commerce happens. Cities are places where you go to, to come up. If you don't have any cities or any commerce, you're never going to have any economic mobility. Yeah. Economic mobility is completely done when cities are done, so or when they're controlled. So they need to be vibrant centers of economy um, and the like. And so we, we based it off of that. What would we do to create a perfect city? I don't mean utopian. I mean, as best as humans can do to keep ourselves in check. Yeah. And so we do that. Um, the reason Wait, we Seneca. chose neighbor is yeah. because it's the second commandment. Okay. So if you want to learn more about Seneca's nonprofit organization and support it, please go to neighborstogetheroakland.org. 
That's neighborstogetheroakland.org. This is an example of a postpartisan solutionary at work. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on YouTube at The Stand Show. Follow us on social media, Kelly for Alaska. Leave a review this week, and you can get a free sticker from Stand if you are selected as our lucky winner. We'll see you next week at Stand. Seneca, thank you for being with us. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you both for having me. God bless you. God bless you. We'll see you next week.